Do you agree that Jesus' death does not mark the end, but rather the beginning of something transformative? If you agree, you are in agreement with a Roman centurion who is present at the crucifixion of Christ. This centurion declared after Jesus' death, truly he is the Son of God. This is one of the remarkable events that occurred after the death of Jesus. And in today's video, you will learn about four fantastic things that happened after the death of Christ. If you are a person who seeks to know the truth and is interested in these subjects, I recommend that you stay in the video until I reveal the fourth event, which is the most impressive of all. Are you ready to embark on this journey? So, let's go. The first event is the shocking reaction of a Roman centurion who witnessed the crucifixion of Christ. Upon witnessing the events of Jesus' death, the centurion declared, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, you may be wondering, who was this centurion? Or what is the importance of a centurion? Understand that, at the height of the Roman Empire, a centurion held a respected position in the military, equivalent today to that of a commander of a battalion of around a hundred soldiers. Just like today, at that time, for a soldier to reach a prestigious position like this, he needed to have overcome several trials and witnessed numerous events that would make him resilient and skeptical, such as death or the experience of losing friends in combat. The centurion was present at the crucifixion of Jesus because, in the eyes of the Roman Empire, the Messiah was considered a heinous criminal, which is why Christ was crucified alongside criminals feared by society. Roman soldiers were sent to maintain order during the execution of the criminals, among whom Jesus was numbered. And to command these soldiers, the centurion was also assigned to that location. Crucifixion was one of the most feared methods of execution by all Romans, so much so that the mere mention of the word cross in a casual conversation was considered a bad word. This method of execution, designed to inflict intense pain and last several days, served as a stern warning to anyone who dared challenge Roman authority. In the Gospel of Mark, the event of that day is specifically detailed, where it is reported that Jesus was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death. He was nailed to a cross, a method commonly used to execute dangerous criminals. The place of his execution was Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Picture this striking scene, three crosses rising against the sky, surrounded by soldiers and a crowd of onlookers. Jesus was in the center, flanked by two criminals. As Jesus hung there, the sky turned black for three hours, an eerie and unsettling phenomenon, as described in Mark 15, 33. In this scenario, the centurion appears, responsible for ensuring that the execution takes place without setbacks. Although he had overseen countless crucifixions as part of his routine, this one proved singularly different. When Jesus uttered his last words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which translates as, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? According to Mark 15:34, it was not just a lament of pain, but a deep echo of desolation in its darkest hour. The centurion, witnessing such a scene, noticed something extraordinary. Mark 15:39 reports his reaction. Upon seeing Jesus expire after such an outcry, he confidently affirmed that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. One imagines the centurion's whirlwind of thoughts, a Roman soldier accustomed to death, faced with a reality that challenged his previous beliefs. It seemed that, in that instant, he saw beyond the ordinary, recognizing something divinely extraordinary in Jesus' death. This stands out for several reasons. Firstly, it represents an impactful testimony from an unlikely source. The centurion, far from being a disciple of Jesus, was part of the mechanism behind his execution. However, his irrefutable realization of the truth before his eyes marks a pivotal moment. This episode not only signals a fissure in the Roman conception of power and authority, but also illuminates the darkness of that day with the recognition of Jesus' true identity, despite the apparent failure of the crucifixion. Furthermore, the centurion's story, with its simple yet profound statement, symbolizes the universal impact of Jesus' life and death. He exemplifies that anyone, regardless of background or beliefs, can discern the truth about Jesus. This recognition by a likely pagan soldier highlights the universal reach of Jesus' message and salvation, crossing cultural and religious barriers, reiterating that Jesus' sacrifice is inclusive. Consider the moment. Jesus, the Son of God, 
had been crucified, a brutal execution reserved for the vilest criminals. His followers and loved ones from a distance watched with hearts filled with grief and bewilderment as the sky, as if in mourning, darkened. This moment of intense sadness also marked the beginning of a turnaround that would alter the course of history. The darkness that surrounded Jesus' crucifixion encourages us to reflect. In the Bible, darkness often symbolizes judgment and divine disapproval. As with the plague of darkness sent to Egypt in Exodus 10, 21 to 23, this singular event denotes a profound act of judgment, a landmark in the history of salvation. This moment was not just any event. It was when the Son of God took on the sin of the world. The darkness reflected the immense weight of sin and the deep sadness of that moment. More than that, it symbolized the mourning and sorrow of creation itself, as if the natural world reacted to the injustice and sadness of Jesus' death. The Creator was being crucified, and the entire creation responded. The darkness at the crucifixion was not just a dramatic setting. It was a profound message about the gravity of the moment, linked to God's judgment. The Old Testament is full of stories and predictions that foreshadow the events of the New Testament, making these connections fascinating elements. A clear example is darkness as a sign present both in the plagues of Egypt, specifically the Ninth Plague, and during the crucifixion of Jesus. In Exodus 10, 21 to 29, palpable darkness covers Egypt for three days as a divine judgment, contrasting with the darkness that enveloped the land during Christ's death, symbolizing a world lost in sin, but also foreshadowing redemption. Darkness, often associated with God's displeasure and judgment, here symbolizes the sadness of a world without Jesus. But Jesus promises light and hope declaring himself the light of the world in John 8:12. Thus, his death plunges the world into temporary darkness, both literally and spiritually setting the stage for the resurrection that brings hope and renewal. The interconnection between Easter and the crucifixion reveals how the physical sacrifice of the Passover lamb and the spiritual sacrifice of Jesus bring liberation to humanity. The darkness of the crucifixion, in addition to reflecting the gravity of Jesus' sacrifice, anticipates the light of the resurrection, offering a message of redemption and renewal deeply rooted in the history of salvation. By carrying the sins of the world on the cross and with the earth shrouded in darkness, Jesus highlights divine justice by transforming the darkest moment into a promise of salvation and light for all. The darkness that enveloped the world at the time of Jesus' crucifixion was not merely a natural event. It reflected a physical manifestation of the spiritual darkness brought by sin. This moment, prophesied in Amos 8 and 9, where the Lord announces that He will cause the sun to set at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight, symbolizes not only the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy, but also highlights the crucifixion as an integral part of the divine plan for salvation. The duration of this darkness for three hours followed by Jesus' final cry and his death temporarily marks the separation between God and humanity, a barrier that would be overcome with his resurrection, bringing light to the world in a literal and symbolic way. This event not only symbolizes a turning point in human history, but also in the relationship between God and creation. Nature's reaction to Jesus' death with darkness covering the earth and the subsequent shaking of the ground and the breaking of rocks illustrates the magnitude of the event. Such natural phenomena are not just dramatic reactions, but symbolize the transition from the old to the new covenant, where through the sacrifice of Jesus, everyone now has direct access to God. The second event was the tearing of the temple veil, it occurred exactly at the time of Jesus' death and is seen as a sign indicating the end of the separation between God and humanity. This act occurring from top to bottom and not by human hands represents divine intervention abolishing the ancient barrier of sin. In the context of the Old Testament, the veil separated the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place in the temple symbolizing the distance between God and people. Jesus' death, however, removes this barrier, allowing everyone direct access to the divine presence, fundamentally transforming the nature of the relationship between God and human beings. 
The new era of grace ushered in by the tearing of the veil replaces the old law with a relationship based on faith and grace. This not only changes how we approach God, but also opens a direct path to a personal and intimate connection with Him. Jesus' sacrifice, therefore, is not only a historical event of redemption, but also an invitation to enter into a relationship transformative with God, without intermediaries. Thus, the darkness at the crucifixion, the tearing of the veil, and the natural phenomena that accompanied Jesus' death are not just dramatic details of a narrative. They are central elements that highlight the depth and significance of what was happening, a moment that changed not only the course of human history, but also the nature of the relationship between God and humanity. The tearing of the veil was as if God was unlocking a door that was previously closed, extending an invitation to us to enter. This action symbolizes an invitation to reconciliation and a new beginning, where the old barriers of separation and restricted access are replaced by an offer of a personal and direct relationship with God. This moment encourages us to a deep reflection. Do we live in the freedom and access that Jesus' sacrifice granted us? Or do we act as if the veil were still present, keeping us distant from God? This question is crucial to our spiritual journey, inviting us to evaluate the depth of our relationship with the divine. The third event is the resurrection of the dead. The earthquakes and the fissure of the rocks were not mere natural events, but rather indicative of a significant spiritual event. The tombs opened, and the bodies of many holy people who had passed away were resurrected. They emerged from their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and showed themselves to many in the holy city, according to Matthew 27 to 52, 53. This fascinating and somewhat mysterious event on the day of Jesus' death suggests that his death was not just a tragedy, but rather a victory over death. The identities of these holy people who had returned to life are not detailed. They are described generically as faithful believers, perhaps prophets or righteous people of the past. This phenomenon served as a prelude to what was to come. Jesus' own resurrection, setting the stage for this main event and acting as a potent sign that death is not the end, both for Jesus and those who believe in him. This event also establishes a connection with the Old Testament, which is full of predictions and clues about future events, such as the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. These clues throughout the Old Testament set the stage for the great revelation of the resurrection. Although the Bible does not present a direct Old Testament prophecy about this specific event of the resurrection of the saints at the time of Jesus' death, it does extensively discuss the concept of resurrection. For example, in Daniel 12, 2, it talks about those who sleep in the dust of the earth awakening to eternal life or eternal contempt foreshadowing the idea of a resurrection. Similarly, in Isaiah 26:19, there is a promise that the dead will live again. These verses set a precedent for what happened when Jesus died, reinforcing the idea that the resurrection is an important issue and that the event of the resurrection of the dead at the time of Jesus' death is a powerful confirmation of the promises made in the Old Testament. Furthermore, the resurrection of Jesus and the saints emphasizes a recurring theme in the Bible, God's power over life and death. The Old Testament often portrays God as the giver of life and Lord over death. When these holy people are resurrected, it serves as a dramatic demonstration of this divine power. Jesus is referred to as the first fruits of those who sleep, an agricultural analogy that indicates that he is the first example of what is to come in terms of resurrection, proving that life after death is a tangible reality and not just an isolated concept. This first fruits title signals that Jesus' resurrection is a promise of future resurrection for all believers, establishing a deep continuity between the Old and New Testaments, uniting the entire biblical narrative into an overarching divine plan. Number 4. The Empty Tomb of Jesus Have you ever wondered about the mysterious events surrounding the empty tomb of Jesus? This story seems straight out of a mystery novel full of unexpected twists. Consider the situation. Jesus, known for his miraculous acts and his messages about love and redemption, has just been executed. 
His disciples find themselves immersed in a whirlwind of sadness, confusion, and fear, not knowing exactly how to proceed. The unfolding of this story begins with the action of a man, Joseph of Arimathea, described in the scriptures as a wealthy individual and member of the Jewish council. Intriguingly, he was also an adherent of Jesus' ideas, albeit in a secret way. Imagine the audacity it took to stand before Pontius Pilate, the Roman administrator, and request the body of Jesus, as recorded in Matthew 27, 57, 58. This gesture not only exposes their fidelity to Jesus, but also puts their own security and social position at risk. Pilate grants the request, and Joseph, with the help of Nicodemus, another supporter of Jesus who also preferred to keep his devotion secret, prepares the body for burial. Together, they take about 34 kilos of myrrh and aloes, following Jewish burial rituals, and deposit Jesus in a new tomb, excavated in the rock by Joseph, where no other body had been placed, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 9, which said that he would be placed alongside the rich at his death. However, what seemed to be the end was just the premise for even more surprising events. The day after the crucifixion, Jewish religious leaders, fearing that Jesus' followers would attempt to steal his body to falsely proclaim his resurrection, a possibility that Jesus had anticipated, request and obtain from Pilate permission to seal the tomb and post guards to keep watch. It, as described in Matthew 27, 62, 66. At dawn on the first day after Saturday, Mary Magdalene and another Mary go to the tomb and are greeted by a shocking scene. An angel sitting on the stone that sealed the entrance to the tomb, now open, and the guards, overcome by fear, they lie as if they were dead. The angel announces to them that Jesus is not there, as he was resurrected, inviting them to see the empty place where he had been placed, according to Matthew 28, 1-6. As the women rush to share the news with the disciples, they encounter Jesus who appears to them and greets them, reiterating the angel's message and instructing them to tell the disciples to go to Galilee, where he will meet them. Meanwhile, some of the guards go to the chief priests and report what happened. Desperate to keep the narrative under control, the priests bribe the soldiers, instructing them to spread the story that the body was stolen by the disciples while they slept, a failed attempt to conceal the truth. The empty tomb transcends the idea of a mere mysterious disappearance, representing the materialization of the power of resurrection and the promise of eternal life offered to all who believe in Jesus. It symbolizes not only hope and renewal, but also the ultimate triumph of life over death, challenging us to reconsider our own beliefs about what is possible and to explore the depths of our faith and our understanding of life. Death and existence beyond. The empty tomb does not mark an end, but rather the dawn of a new era of understanding. As we conclude this journey through the stories that unfolded after Jesus' death, it is evident that the veil between the divine and the earthly was, symbolically and literally, torn. Jesus' death was not the end, but rather the prelude to a new dawn for humanity. The extraordinary events that followed, the darkness that enveloped the earth, the tearing of the temple veil, the resurrection of the saints and the empty tomb are more than chapters in an ancient sacred text. They are testimonies of the unbreakable power of faith, love, and the promise of renewal. Each event, meticulously woven into the fabric of sacred history, serves as a reminder that there are forces at work greater than we can comprehend. The Roman centurion, the darkness that covered the earth, the tearing of the veil, and the resurrection of the dead are not just accounts of faith, they are also signs of a love and a promise that transcend the barriers of time and space, inviting us all to a deep reflection on the meaning of life, death, and eternity. And so, as we reflect on the meaning of these events, we are also invited to take action. If these stories resonate with you, if they touch your heart in some way, I invite you to express that connection. Like this video, share it with those who also seek to understand or even find comfort in these narratives, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any updates. Together we can continue to explore the depths of faith in the human spirit, 
And now, as we prepare to close this chapter, I leave you with a teaser for the next one. Why doesn't God forgive Satan and the fallen angels? This is a question that takes us even deeper into the mystery of faith and divine justice. I invite you to click on the screen that appears to find out. Click, explore, and continue the journey with us in the search for understanding and enlightenment. Remember, the empty tomb is not the end, but rather a new beginning, an invitation for all of us to rediscover life, death, and what lies beyond through the lens of faith. Thank you for sharing this moment with us. To the next.